It's a pleasure to uh, welcome you for um, this last morning. We have a very, very interesting day of presentations for you again today. Um, and the keynote address this morning is going to be given by um, Dr. Gary Grimm from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Um, Dr. Grimm uh, got his PhD at the University of California, Davis, and um, working on um, detectors and things related more to um, particle physics. And uh, as with um, many people who have gotten into imaging, sometimes it began with the, with the, with the um, design of, um, of uh, sensors uh, with lots of pixels, and all of a sudden you realize with lots of pixels you can do imaging and other things. Um, Gary has moved on from University of California, Davis, and spent a significant amount of time working on experiments at Fermilab and CERN related to the high energy physics machines there. Um, had spent a little over a decade at Los Alamos National Laboratories where he got involved with the National Ignition Facility at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And I guess it was in 2017, 15, the 15 uh, moved to NIF um, to lead the group there working on diagnostics and uh, on the NIF and uh, related experiments, and he's going to tell us about inertial confinement fusion. I'll let him describe what it's all about, but uh, I think you're in for a real treat. All right. Well, thank you, Lars. I want to also thank the College of Optical Sciences, Dean Koch, for uh, inviting me down here this morning to talk with you. So uh, this talk is about inertial confinement fusion, and I'll try and define what that is during this talk. I want to give you a kind of a brief history. This is, you know, my version of the history of how we got to inertial confinement fusion first. This will be the kind of sciencey part, since it, this topic is probably pretty well unknown to people in this room. And then I'll go a little geeky technology and show you what the tools are that we use. I can't possibly cover very, you know, deeply, um, or even the breadth of this technology, but I'll spend some time on that to give you a flavor of it. And then I'll talk a little bit about Lawrence Livermore National Lab and the enterprise involved in this inertial confinement fusion research. Okay, so to begin the history of fusion, there's uh, no simple place to start, but I'm going to pick 1920, and in particular an address by Sir Arthur Eddington to the British Association for the Advancement of Science at, at Cardiff. And in this address, um, Eddington was documenting or cataloging what we knew about the um, properties of stars and the universe at this point, and in particular, our sun. And we knew a lot about the sun at that point, and we knew a lot about stellar evolution at that point. But there was one key piece of information we didn't know, and what was the source, and that was what was the source of power of the sun. And in this address, Eddington used deductive reasoning to come up with some just stunning conjectures. The first one was that we've exhausted, given what we knew about physics in 1920, we've exhausted all the possible sources of power for the sun, except one, that it be subatomic. The next conjecture that he pointed out is we know the mass of the sun, so if it were subatomic, this means the sun's age or total lifetime could exceed 15 billion years. And further, recent measurements um, it by F.W. Aston had shown that the mass of the hydrogen atom, if you multiplied it by four, was greater than the mass of the helium. And they had the Rutherford model of the atom at this point, so they knew s that the nucleus was quantized in terms of protons, at least. We still needed another 20 years for the neutron. But nonetheless, he recognized this mass discrepancy at the subatomic level. <clears throat> and further, he drew upon Einstein's uh, presenting us with a notion that energy and mass are equivalent. And so from this, he postulated that if four hydrogen atoms could be fused into one helium atom, that that mass difference, since mass can't, is conserved, can't just show up um, or can't, can't be annihilated, but it had to produce energy, and the process of fusion was born. Okay, so let's get quantitative about this. And here's where we go a little bit science -y, and I'm sorry, we're going to just have to uh, not go into you know, pedagogical motivation. But I'm going to start with Einstein's relationship, and the reason I'm going to do that is because you see in this relationship that energy units are equal to mass units times the speed of light squared. So that means I'm going to work in this funny unit of mass being energy divided by c squared. And then I'm going to conveniently convert back to energy just by multiplying by c squared without showing you. 
And the point here is, is that Eddington's uh, conjecture was that we can take four hydrogen atoms, which in this Rutherford model looks like this. So we just sum up the mass of a proton and electron, multiply it by four, and we get 3,755 MeV per C squared. And if we make a, the comparison to what we now know the mass of a helium, a helium atom is, it turns out to be 3,000, whoops, sorry about that, 3,728 MeV squared. The difference being 26.7 MeV now in energy. All right, so what is that? Is that significant or not? Well, if we go back to our you know, introductory electronics class, we know that an electron passing through a potential of a volt gets one EV of energy. Therefore, a megavolt gives you one MeV of energy. Okay, this is all relatively simple physics. You know also that that EV of energy corresponds in joules to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. I'm going to get to this point now that one MeV of, of energy is not a whole lot of energy. It's you know, a million times this, which turns out to be in some food you know, unit of energy, a tiny amount of kilocalories, right? It's insignificant. However, if you have four moles of hydrogen, something uh, that uh, isn't that significant in terms of volume and we'll come to, then the total energy released is 10 to the 12 joules, a few times 10 to the 12 joules. In a home electrical units, that's roughly 730 megawatt hours. For reference, in the 2018, the typical American home used 11 megawatt hours for the year. So in this calculation, four grams of hydrogen, which is teaspoon scale, could power 66 homes for a year. So this kind of calculation motivated from the time of Eddington and through most of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, an enterprise to understand how could we use this source of power for generating electricity to power our homes, power our cars, make movies like Back to the Future. Okay, so now we're going to skip forward, and this slide is going to summarize this in the next one. 30 years of the most significant physics we've done in about four bullets, so please forgive me again. All right, Eddington's conjecture was four hydrogens, um, weighs more than one helium, but then if you write an energy conservation equation, what you say is that the mass of the four hydrogens is equal to the mass of the helium plus some energy, we'll call binding energy. Now, that intervening years through the, the 20s, 30s, and 40s required quantum mechanics to be developed to explain this, and nuclear physics, nuclear structure physics to explain this. Nonetheless, what we're seeing here is, is that if you change these initial state to some final state, there's going to be also a change in the energy associated with the, the final state. We call that binding energy. So we're going to introduce a new quantity called Q, and that's that energy difference between the final state, the mass of the final state, sorry, and the mass of the initial state. But we know masses of, of elements nuclei are just sums of neutrons, sums of protons, sums of electrons if you want to add them in, plus this energy state. And if we take the difference, we know conservation laws for, for what we call baryons or neutrons and protons you know, hold. So those masses are going to cancel out and what's going to be left is the, just the difference between the binding energy of the final state and the binding energy of the initial state. And that is going to correspond to the energy that's released when you take uh, four hydrogens and uh, can fuse them into one helium. Okay, the key insight here is that reaction is exothermic if the final state binding energy exceeds that of the initial state. So if we can find processes where the final state binding energy is greater than the initial state binding energy, then energy will be released, kinetic energy will be released by the system, and this is the basis for fusion. Okay, so during that period, uh, a lot of theory and measurement, based on measurements, was developed, and this plot was generated. And what this plot shows you is, it's on the horizontal axis here, is the mass of a nucleus. And on the vertical axis here is the binding energy per nucleon of that nucleus, or the nucleus of that mass. And the trend that you see in this plot is that as you increase mass, the binding energy per nucleon increases. And that continues up to a point, iron 56, and then it decreases. 
And so the key aspect of this point is, is if you're to the left of iron 56, as you take the initial state and you fuse it together, so you take two nuclei, you fuse it into another nuclei, as long as that final nuclei or one of the final nuclei is below iron 56, that, that fusion process is going to release energy. If you are above that, it re will require energy to cause that fusion to occur. On the other hand, you can increase the binding energy per nucleon if you start over here and move to the left, and we call that process fission. And so that's the basis of most nuclear production today. All right, so after the, the, the basic physics of fusion and the fusion process is worked out, a lot of energy went into studying, okay, what, we, we, um, hydro, fusing hydrogen into to helium isn't practical when it occurs in the sun and it occurs in conditions that aren't easy to replicate on Earth. Right? It's, 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 a, it's a massive beast. It's incredibly high pressures at its core. Um, it's just not possible to make that process go. It's, it's very improbable. But a lot of effort was ex, uh, expended in trying to find what fuels could we use in a laboratory environment to create energy and to um, prop, uh, possibly help ourselves out uh, for uh, long-term supply. And so this plot here, this, this um, graph here, shows you a synopsis of the studies done on the prospective fuels for fusing uh, in a laboratory. And the, the, the top fuel that you'll hear a lot about, is the, or the top fusion process that you hear a lot about in this talk and just even colloquially, is the fusion of a deuterium, um, ion with a tritium ion. And the reason that that was, uh, I'll, I'll explain that in a second why it's the most probable or the, um, the most uh, discussed, but th there are other fuels as well. So you can fuse de deuterium with itself. Uh, you can fuse deuterium with helium. You can fuse deuterium with lithium, protons with lithium, and protons with boron I've got listed here. And what you get is shown as a result of that fusion is shown in the second column. So with the DT fusion, you can get an alpha plus a neutron. DD, helium three plus neutron. Uh, proton, bor 11, you can get three alphas. An alpha is a, is a helium um, nucleus, a helium four nucleus, sorry. Now the key to this is when you do these fusions, you get this much energy released. That's the energy with which you can generate electricity. You can turn into heat and generate power. So this number is quite important. You'd like this number to be large, but you'd also like the product to be something that you can use to heat something with as well. Neutrons, they're okay. You know, they, they're not very interactive, so they, don't, they, they, they escape readily. So they're not the greatest, and most of the energy of DT goes into neutrons. But alphas are actually quite good. So anything that produces an alpha, it stops and something heats it up, and you can use that for power. All right, well, so, so this is the list that looks interesting. Over here on the right is the nuclear physics that says what's the likelihood it's useful. So what I've got plotted here is temperature. And the reason it's in units of temperature is because the way that most, the, the, it, was, it was recognized early on that it was very inefficient to use an accelerator to cause fusion process to go because of the luminosity of the accelerator. It's, it's the, just the, the density of particles is quite low. So the notion was we're going to replicate the sun in a miniature scale. So we've got to heat these ions up to a temperature that's sufficient to cause fusion to occur, overcome the Coulomb barrier. So what you've got here is in units of KeV. This is millions of degrees Kelvin and um, tens of millions of degrees Kelvin. And down here is 1 KeV, 10 KeV, 100 KeV. And what you're looking at here are the probabilities for the fusion reaction to occur for various different reactions, DT being the one that sits at the top of the curve and is, is basically 100 times more probable than any other reaction like D helium three or DD. Oh, and by the way, since this is a thermal process, we've got to heat these fuel ions up. And really the lab accessible temperatures for doing that are in this range of kind of 10 to 100 KeV from a practicality standpoint. So, the, uh, and it's worth noting, the sun operates down here at the very corner end at, at one KeV. Okay, so DT fusion has sort of been dominating the game. We, we use DD fusion uh, quite regularly in the laboratory from a diagnostic standpoint because it produces less energetic particles at lower yields, about 100 times lower yields. 
So it's less uh, harsh to work with in the laboratory. Okay, so we have the physics to establish fusing, fusion. Uh, now we need to kind of set some uh, parameters on if we're going to do this for uh, energy production, what are the requirements on the facility, the reactor, the conditions uh, in order to produce energy? And in 1956, uh, J.D. Lawson published a, a criterion in a paper that says these are kind of the, the, the basic rough conditions you need for a fusion reactor. And it's fairly simple stuff, right? I mean, you just need the fusion energy to be greater than the en thermal energy plus losses. What does that mean? Well, the thermal energy is the energy you have to put into that DT to get fusion to start going. It costs you something to do that. So you have to exceed that energy threshold and fusion energy to get energy out. Plus, while you're doing that, you're losing energy. There's you know, inefficiencies from the wall plug all the way to when that fusion fuel gets hot, it wants to throw energy out of it. It wants to radiate it away. It wants to thermally conduct it away. So you have to overcome those losses as well. Okay, well, like any good physicist, Lawson and others have said, ah, we're going to do this to the, we're going to get this stuff so hot, we're going to get to the point where the losses are, are less than the fusion energy. So we're just going to assume that this equation. And that results in the following equation. On the left is a, an expression of the fusion energy coming out of a, a, a fusing, a thermally hot fusing fuel. The N up there corresponds to the density you achieve to get that fuel hot. The sigma V is that probability plot I showed you. That's the cross section averaged over the velocity distribution of that thermal plasma. Tau, that's the time you've held it together. Uh, once it you know, gets hot, it's going to want to come apart. So there's some time that you've got energy production. And then Q is the energy released. And you want that to exceed, whoops, sorry just the basic uh, thermal energy that went into the system. OK, when you rearrange the equation in terms of the, the, the quantities density times pressure, this uh, uh, is on the left side of the equation, then you get an expression which is entirely a function of temperature on the right side of the equation. And if you assume that the temperature is about 5 kilovolts, you can put this right side of the equation into just a simple numeric expression, which is 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 seconds per centimeter cube. So if you can design a reactor that achieves a density of the fuel for some time tau, that is in this range, 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 15 centimeter, or sorry, seconds per centimeter cube for DT at a temperature around 5 kilovolts, then you will get out more energy than you've put in. And so this is the target for much of the fusion research, energy based uh, fusion research towards energy production that goes on in the world right now, including magnetic fusion, ICF, you name it. Okay, so this leads to a simple taxonomy in these equations. The first one we all know about, gravitational combined. It's what powers our sun. This is a high density, low temperature, long uh, assembly time system. Not very useful for us directly in fusion, you know, using it as a fusion source. It's a great solar source, uh, electrical panels and thermal panels and, and what na uh, you name it. Um, another type of system that's frequently uh, uh, you come across in, in literature is magnetic confinement, magnet magnetically confined systems. These systems use a much lower density than, than the sun. Uh, these are typically... Uh, a million times less dense than solid density. Uh, they have fairly high temperatures, oops, sort of, you know, tens of kilovolts. And they have mid-time confinements. So this is, you know, anywhere from, you know, many tens of minutes to many hours. And that type of system is what you'll uh, see being researched in the magnetic confinement community started out in the mid-50s, it was instantly recognized as a, a prospective path forward in a, in a project called Project Sherwood, which was a classified U.S. research project up until the early 60s, and then that was the forerunner to uh, Tokamax and, and ITER, which is a big, major facility being built in France. Finally, we're going to talk about inertial confinement. Inertial confinement, which is what the rest of this talk will be based on, is a very high-density, mid-temperature, few kilovolt, uh, short time scale system. 
1956, when Lawson postulated the, the criterion, we didn't know how to do this. It was, it, it was getting to this high pressure for a short time just wasn't possible. So that was out of the game for a while. Then 1960 came along and, and Theodore Maiman changed the game. And this was the, the, really the birth of modern ICF. So um, very, very quickly after the announcement of the uh, solid state laser by Maiman, people at Los Alamos, uh, in particular Sterling Colgate, or sorry, Los Alamos, Livermore, Sterling was at Los Alamos actually for many years. In fact, he was at the boys' school before Los Alamos was Los Alamos, the Los Alamos boys' school. Anyway, I knew Sterling. He had gone to a conference uh, on lasers in 1961 in Geneva. Coming back from that, realized that he could generate high pressures using a laser. He went back, talked to John Nichols, who was running the program, the fusion program for Teller at the time. He put, tell, uh, Nichols put Kidder on it, and they quantified and documented the process of generating high pressures using lasers that could be useful for ICF. Then there is now, this is 1961, 50 years, 40 years, depending on how you count, of development and papers and what have you, getting to where we are today at the NIF. I'm not going to cover that here today. But that, to me, is kind of the nutshell of how we got to modern ICF, starting with Eddington and really kind of you know, being kicked off here with the, with the invention of the laser. So why is the laser useful? Well, we know the loss in criteria. It's this um, relationship above. ICF, you want to get to solid, a thousand times solid density. And if you do the math, actually the confinement times are less than this, but I'm going to round up from you know, fractions of a nanosecond to just a nanosecond. So now you need to assemble fuels and hold them together for about a few nanoseconds if you can. This means we need a driver, something that can do that assembly, that can handle this type of time scale. And Lasers are that perfect driver. They can generate the pressures, and they can be uh, modulated on a very, very fast time scale. I'm working on experiments now where we're using a 50 femtosecond laser pulse, and you can go down to add a second these days. Lasers are incredible this way. So this application is tailor-made for the laser. Sorry, I went through that so quick. All right, so now let me go to the modern ICF platform. All right, and I apologize. I'm just diving right into the deep end. There's a lot of questions that you're probably going to have. But the idea with the modern ICF platform is we're going to start with a sphere. It's a spherical shell. It's made out of a low, mid-Z plastic carbon material. And it's going to be hollow. Uh, it's going to then have deuterium and tritium fuel uh, loaded into it. And we're going to cryogenically cool that fuel so that we're going to grow a solid density ice layer of deuterium and tritium right against the outer or the inner uh, radius of that shell. And then we'll leave a low density vapor of DT in the center. And what we'll do is we're going to hit the outer surface of that shell, that plastic shell or carbon shell with radiation that's going to cause the ions that are on the outer surface to recoil, accelerate away, and cause the shell to then recoil and implode. And in doing that implosion, we're going to do PDV work on that deuterium and tritium. And we're going to, uh, PDV work is, you know, pressure times the volume change. And that PDV work is going to heat the deuterium and tritium. And the goal is to get the central gas uh, in that deuterium tritium up to this five kilovolts that I was talking about earlier. When that happens, you're going to start to produce tremendous numbers of neutrons and alpha particles. Those alpha particles in the core are going to leave and strike that high-density DT or stop in that high-density DT and heat it. And when that heating occurs, that's going to induce more fusions. And so we're going to get this propagating burn until the assembly gets to such a high pressure it just pulls itself apart. That's the theory. Those are the numbers for how we try to do this. So the uh, density at compression of that DT went from 250 milligrams per cc, this ice, thick ice layer, to almost 1,000 grams per cc when we do this. Now at NIF, we don't use direct illumination of the capsule. This is a, um, a choice that was uh, learned from a lot of experience in the nuclear weapons program. X-rays work much more efficiently at 
ablating the surface of the capsule. They're more uniform in terms of not inducing seeding, what we call instabilities that can grow in and, and, and damage the implosion. The laser we use to do this is called the NIF, the National Ignition Facility Laser. Uh, it's one of a long line of lasers that were built to work on this problem, uh, starting back in 1970 when Knuckles and Zimmerman wrote their initial nature paper. They speculated that we could get by with a few kilojoules of laser. We're now at almost two megajoules of laser. <laughs> the laser is uh, able of achieving 500 terawatts. It uses 192 beams to do this. Um, it's frequency tripled neodymium glass, so we're down in when we when we put light into that um, target, which this is a, a gold cylinder we call a whole ROM. The light comes into it. It's in the blue. It's 351 nanometers. Uh, the pulse lengths now we typically use are between, depending on the experiment, 8 and 12 nanoseconds. Uh, there's a reason for that we can talk about at lunch if you like. Uh, but it's capable of doing much longer, and we started out closer to 25. Okay, so now I'm going to shift gears, and we're going to go a little gee whiz fun. I've got a couple of movies. One of them shows you uh, the laser in operation. It's, a, it's, not, it's not the actual laser, not, but it's, it's a... Uh, uh, a cartoon, a movie cartoon. And then the second movie I want to show you um, will uh, give you some sense of the process we go through and, and the, the technologies and people involved. Um, and so if you'll bear with me here, I'll see if I can get this to launch. And I'm going to have to advance this. I want to advance this to get rid of on this one. And is there... Um, sound that's going to be oh my sound isn't working ah I should have tested that okay so this is the National Ignition Facility um, this is located in Livermore California this is the NIF laser beam um, I uh, would like to yeah okay so this is preamble on the uh, Okay, so this is the NIF laser. There are two laser bays opposite the capacitor banks. The, the laser bays have these uh, 192 beams uh, that are on a 300 foot uh, times. Uh, so this is eight of the laser beams. Sorry, I'm just doing this on the fly. This is all edited. Uh, so, that, so right now the laser beams are passing through the, the power amplifiers and then being uh, switched into the uh, main amplification stage. But this whole process starts with the, the um, capacitor banks that are in the center part of the system. We fire these capacitor banks to charge uh, the uh, strobe lamps that flash the neodymium glass. Um, when that happens, then we energize, well, you know, the lasing process. Uh, we uh, invert the population in the neodymium glass to then stimulate emission when the laser li or when light passes through it. But the whole process starts right here in the master oscillator room where we're taking nanojoules scale of laser light through a fiber-based system. This is a solid state laser. And we're forming the pulse shape and we're modulating it to give us the precise characteristics that we want in time. And then we send that out through fibers to the laser bay where it's then separated into the various different uh, quads or uh, um, clusters of beams. And then we go through the initial amplification process through our regen amplifiers. And then we send that up into the main uh, amplifier uh, stage. And while we're doing this, we're maintaining the um, pulse shape qualities uh, through transport spatial filtering. We're doing things like we have, uh, we know where damage in the final optics are. So we have beam blockers to, to, to protect the beams. Okay, now the beams are just going through uh, the various amplification stage. These are our, our um, the, the previous amplifiers were the, the power amplifier, um, or pre-amplifier, sorry. Um, the total time, or the total distance that the light will travel um, is close to 1,500 meters before it gets uh, into the, um, um, the, the target chamber. Sorry, I, I really am disappointed. This yeah, has a very cool little, um, you know, background 
Okay, so now we're going back up, back through. We go through the power amplifiers four times, back up through the main amplifier, and then I think we're making our long run to the switch yard. Yep. Okay, so these hundred and uh, well, there's hundred and you know, ninety six of these these beams before they're split um, into four. Um, there's 96 quads, as we call them, that are injected into uh, the switch yard. So 196 beam paths, but each one of these beam paths is subdivided into four beams that will be focused independently. We have to m make uh, great care in the optical path length as these beams come into the switch yard and enter the target chamber. So what's happening now is we're just transporting the beam to the target chamber. Um, the beams then come in, and right there we have they pass through what's called the final optics assembly. Their tri frequency tripled and focused with wedge focusing elements onto the gold cylinder, the and thermal mechanical package. The beams then are focused into you know, a few ten micron spot size spots on the wall of the cylinder. That produces X-rays. Those X-rays then ablate the capsule, cause the capsule to implode. And voila, we have a um, plasma that disassembles some few nanoseconds later. Oops. Okay. So to give you a sense of the losses a system like this um, has, um, I have this diagram here which shows you some of the inefficiencies, if you will, built into the system. So in this particular uh, uh, slide, we're starting out with a fair bit of laser energy, 1.3 megajoules. Uh, when the laser energy, it's 1.3 megajoules in the blue, 351 nanometers. We, we started out with over 4 megajoules in the red, and then we had losses in the KDB. Uh, actually, we have losses. You still have laser light coming into the laser, uh, laser bay in both the red and the green. They're just not focused by the lens, and so they, they don't make it in the hole, the, the cylinder. They scatter around the cylinder, and I'll show you uh, an important piece of that uh, next. Okay, so, so we start out in this example with 1.3 megajoules. Uh, it turns out when the laser hits that gold cylinder, uh, it generates plasma. That plasma responds to the laser light because it's plasma. It can respond rather rapidly to the laser frequency. And so you set up uh, oscillations in the ions and the electrons of that plasma that radiate, and we lose some of that energy. It's backscattered. We call that laser plasma instabilities. And it's sent back up the laser beam. So we have to be very, very careful not to damage the laser by limiting that. We typically lose about 12% of the laser energy to that. And then some of it's just lost in heating the plasma, uh, creating the low density plasma. So we get about 75% of the laser energy that's in the, the whole ROM coming into x-rays. Uh, those x-rays then leave the wall, heat the wall, go deeper into the wall. They go out the hole that the laser beam came through. And so we only wind up getting about 12% of those x -ray, that x-ray energy onto the capsule. So we've already lost almost, you know, 90% of our energy and laser energy going in. Now, if we renormalize to say, okay, how much of the is on the capsule? That's about from this, starting from this, 160 kilojoules. Okay. And most of that energy goes into knocking the ablator ions off the capsule to cause the implosion to go. So that doesn't even make it into heating the fuel. There is PDB work occurring, of course. Uh, some of it just goes into heating the, that plastic capsule. What winds up getting into the actual DT is three kilojoules into the hot spot from the PDV heating and seven kilojoules of energy into the DT fuel, heating that up a little bit and making it dense. So the energy inefficiency of this system is very, very high because you want these numbers here, this is totaling 10 kilojoules. You want as much energy from your source to get into that DT fuel as you can and it's gone from 1.3 to t uh, megajoules to only 10 kilojoules. However, it is possible to make very, very hot and reactive plasmas, plasmas and a lot of work is continuing uh, uh, at NIF right now 
we're producing fairly high neutron yields or DT fusion yields even with this little amount of energy. Okay, so I have another movie here. This really is a movie that needs sound, so I'm not quite sure what the, the challenge is. What I, I think I can do is... I am actually in HDMI right now. So what I think I... Well, here's what I propose. I'm just going to... Sorry? They are not. I, I'd be happy to do that. There may be a uh, slight, oh, I need my uh, adapter. So I'm not sure. Let's see. What do we have to switch? Is anybody driven this? OK. Let's see if this, if this doesn't work. I can, I've got. Yeah. Yeah, this is there we go. Okay, so the purpose of this is is to give you a sense of what goes on on a NIF shot. You probably need to mute my microphone. Okay, so this is giving you a sense of what we go through on a shot, um, and, and the, the um, you know, narration here, obviously, the captions here, sort of telling you what's going on and, and, and doing a little bit of selling on the NIF mission. So in a typical shot, this is Luisa and Laura. Uh, they're a team. Luisa's the experimentalist. Laura is a, what we call a, a designer. They're going over the process of designing the experiment right now. Uh, they work with target engineers to design that target I showed you, the changes that you want to make from experiment to experiment. Those changes then get captured in, I mean, it's a very rigorous engineering process we follow. Uh, it then gets uh, transferred over to the target uh, engineering team. And the target engineering team has an amazing uh, a number of precision engineering resources available to, to them. It's really quite remarkable. They work on producing the target. In the meantime, what you saw briefly was there is a significant operations staff, both engineering and physicists and, and many others, who put together the, the experiment in terms of diagnostics, in terms of uh, the laser, preparing the laser for the shot. Here we have the acute um, robot and the, the crusty guy delivering the target. Um, yeah, the music kind of the, the one thing about muting this is they go from that, you know, electric piano to Muzak when they do that elevator scene. It's kind of cute. All right, so this is the guys in the, the target area engineers putting together the, the experiment uh, inside the target bay. Uh, they're loading. This is a debris shield that they're loading into the cassette. They're loading 
what we call diagnostic instrument manipulators that go into the vacuum chamber. This is the shroud that goes around the target. We, like I said, we cool the target to cryogenic temperature, so we have to isolate it from the environment while we're uh, getting ready. We start that cooling process days in advance. This is the control room where the operators for the uh, different system, laser subsystems work, coordinated by the shot director. Uh, I'll show a follow-up to that laser target chamber. Uh, here they're doing final touches on pre uh, preparing the fiber laser for pulse shaping in the more room. Uh, this is your, yeah, we're safe. You know, we go around making sure no one's hiding behind a capacitor. Um, that door, I don't know if you caught it, it's, it's quite a few fit, feet thick. When we produce the neutrons uh, on a typical NIF shot, it's lethal to be inside the NIF target chamber. So we, we sweep it and we shield it with many feet of concrete plus the building. Um, okay, so now they're interlocking and making sure that no one can uh, get back in uh, once it's swept. They're readying all the systems. They've got a fair amount of, there's, you know, significant uh, software engineering effort for controls and, um, you know, positioning the target and components. This is the target bay. That's the target chamber in blue. This is a spectrometer. Neutrons hit deuterium ions and send them into a magnetic field in that, that device. And there you have it. And we do, we do repeat this process that I just showed you on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times per day. Uh, NIF typically shoots 400 times per year. Okay, let's see, I always advance. All right, here's a close up of the NIF target. This is an actual, uh, uh, actually one actually used in the experiment. Remember I talked about the red and the blue. We have to make sure that that energy doesn't go back up the laser, get amplified and damage the laser. So we, we put, what we call dimple shields on the outside. So the laser enters into this smaller circular area here into the, the whole ROM. This is actually, you're looking at the thermal mechanical package surrounding the gold whole ROM. And then uh, again, more dimple shields down here and here just to protect the facility. That all goes inside that, that shroud. Uh, that is, sits inside the target position or for many days where uh, the thermal cycling occurs and we grow a layer of DTIs and we x-ray it through holes in the shroud to make sure it meets the roughness qualities that we have for doing these experiments. Once we've established and we now have a process that works pretty good for uh, how to get the roughness that we like, uh, then we can proceed with the experiment. Okay, here is uh, the NIF target chamber. It's 10 meters in diameter. It's a big sucker. Um, you've got a five meter diving board that you're working on to position the target at the center of the target chamber. There are some diagnostics that come in uh, uh, that look at the target from a few centimeters away. So this is a, this is a big engineering enterprise to, to make this all work. We're trying to align the target to the lasers to better than a few microns from five meters away from your, your target bay wall. Okay, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but there's four key uh, parameters that we want to um, control when we make these implosions. We want to make sure that we, when we, when we hit the, the uh, capsule with the laser, that we don't hit it too hard. We call that the adiabat. We want a low adiabat because that adiabat is uh, heating the uh, fuel uh, sooner than we want it to be heated and that makes it harder to compress. We, the yield of the experiment goes to a very high power velocity, almost eight. So we want to get to very, very high velocity. So we, um, uh, need to um, monitor that. We want to make sure material from the, the non-deuterium and tritium material from the capsule does not get into the center. That brings electrons that radiate energy. That poisons the implosion. We've got to control mix. And then we want to make it efficient, so we want to make it as spherical possible. To monitor these, we use a variety of different optical diagnostics. So we will send in lasers reflected off of shocks, send it through an interferometer, and look at just how fast shocks going through the capsule are moving. We will uh, x-radiograph, transmission radiograph the capsule on implosion and use a framing camera to look at how fast it's moving at key times of the implosion. Uh, we use x-ray spectrometers, so we use Bragg diffraction off of crystals to tell us what the energy of the uh, x-rays coming out of the center of the capsule are and tell us whether we're seeing 
uh, lines from elements that we think are poisoning the implosion. And then finally, we use just straight up source imaging. Uh, standard kind of stuff, pinhole imaging, in fact. The oldest form of imaging there is. Camera obscura. And I'm gonna talk to you about one of those. Okay, there are 100 types of, there are 100 different diagnostics we can field on any given shot. We field 50, 60 at a time when we do this. Uh, we, I'm not gonna go through this list in detail, but they fall into X-ray, optical, and nuclear. Uh, we have done projects here at, at OpSci on uh, gamma imaging for the NIF. So it, it, it spans the spectrum of, of techniques. So everything that goes on here and in other institutions around the country can be applied to our um, uh, experiments at NIF. We're measuring things down to the tens of picosecond level in terms of precision on a timing scale. We're measuring things down to the micron scale in the imaging world, five micron scale resolution. Um, we're measuring uh, with optical reflectometers uh, um, uh, in the laser beam to monitor the laser. It's, it's, a, it's a real tour de force of diagnostic capability. I think that program operationally runs at about $50 million a year for this facility. Okay, I'm gonna talk about one specific form of imaging and I'm gonna have to do this quick because I wanna get on to the last bit and that is uh, neutron imaging. So right now we are, um, when we produce these DT neutrons, we get 14 MeV neutrons that come out. We want to look at the source distribution of those neutrons, and we have three lines of sight now that which we're doing that. So this is pinhole imaging. It's it's a, you know a, a, a tried and true technique, except for one minor issue: neutrons are penetrating. They 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 are they get out of everything. That's why they're so useful for diagnostics on NIF. We use pinholes that are. 10, 15 micron straws, if you might think of it, in a 20 centimeter chunk of gold. That's our pinhole. It's a, it's a major um, engineering force to build this. We use diamond turning of thin gold foils. They're actually wedges. We stack those up, and uh, then we push, put this block, this pinhole imager, very close to the target, within a few tens of centimeters. This shows an example of our, our um, second imager pinhole, there's three of them as I showed in that previous plot. I know that I did this quick, whoops. The target goes here and then three pinholes goes go 20 centimeters away from the target in this 10 meter diameter sphere. Uh, we, the, the latest one, just to mention for Brad, <laughs> uh, had, the latest line of sight has uh, an array of large aperture, penumbral apertures that we're using for gamma imaging. We have a gamma camera actually being set up in that line of sight. Okay, so the first imager uh, that we put at the NIF, uh, I led the design for that. Here again is just another uh, plan view of things. Uh, target chamber center, 10 meter ball, 30 meters out to the, the actual recording system. And the reason we need that is we need the magnification to get that 50 micron diameter source large enough to record on CCDs and microchannel plate camera systems. Uh, this is the recording table. We take two pictures. The uh, way we do that is the neutrons come in, sorry, from the left through this hole. You know, 30 meters up that way is the source. Uh, they interact in a plastic scintillator made of coherent fiber arrays. The light from those coherent fiber arrays totally internally reflects in both directions. One goes straight into one camera. There's a mirror that's missing right here. It goes into this lens that goes into the second camera. We can control when we take the pictures by taking the light that comes down the lens and sticking it into what we call a microchannel plate, which is just a photomultiplier a tube in effect with a gate on the shutter on the front. With that, what we can do then is we can get three different projections of the neutron source. And from that, we can invert to get a three-dimensional production of the neutron, you know, the neutron production distribution. This is what a raw image looks like from our new system, actually, um, recorded on a, a, an image plate rather than a camera. But we take the data from this uh, array of images, turn that into one of these images, and then take these three and turn that into this. Uh, I'm, I won't cover the details of this, it's just too busy. All right, so now let me get on to the final bit of this. This is the, 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 the advertising piece, if you will. 
This is, a, this is not a small enterprise inertial confinement fusion. In the, in the United States, it's a half a billion dollar program in the Department of Energy, uh, National Nuclear Security Administration. Uh, but it's also an international program. The French have copied, uh, where is France? Here we go. Uh, they have copied our laser to zeroth order. They haven't completely uh, uh, populated it with glass, but they are also very interested in using uh, 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 laser-based ICF as a source of energy. And the Chinese now are also very actively pursuing similar research. But within the, this slide here, all of these different uh, sites, both in the UK, France, uh, United States, are, are contributing to the ICF research at Livermore and, even, and also in Japan. Okay, one thing that we need are people. And it's, it, it spans the spectrum from crusty people who've been doing this for 50 and 40 years and are about ready to retire, or have retired and are just continuing to do it. People like me, who are not yet ready to retire but thinking about it. And then we rely heavily on young staff, postdocs, and students. I've brought in uh, several students, undergraduates, as interns to work on key diagnostic projects. We actively do that every year. Liver, um, um, Livermore has a website that you can go to if you're interested uh, that covers both the postdoc and scholar programs. Um, it's a very supportive environment to work in. It's very professional. Um, when you walk in as an undergraduate, you're treated as a peer. It's, it's, a, it's a great place uh, to gain experience, decide if it's something you're interested in or um, you know, if this is the direction you want to head. Uh, we will do everything we can to bend your mind to come back and work for us. So uh, understand you will have to deal with that. We had 1,000 students engaged in research at Livermore in 2017. And you know, we have a, a, a broad number of uh, core mission areas in which they work, including uh, uh, you know, we have a Seaborg Institute for Nuclear Physics. Uh, we do a lot of uh, cyber security work, cyber defense. Uh, nuclear radiochemistry is a, is a big core area for our uh, nuclear weapons mission. There's, uh, computational chemistry is becoming a big deal. So, so there are a lot of non-ICF places to go at Livermore. Just in case you didn't know where Livermore was, it's uh, located in Northern California, east of San Francisco, about 40 miles. Uh, there's a valley, uh, we call it the Tri-Valley area, that uh, out on the east side of the valley, right before you go into the San Joaquin Valley, there's a one square mile postage stamp, which is Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. It used to be called the Lawrence Radiation Lab. Uh, and then was made a national laboratory somewhere in the uh, late 90s, early 90s. There's also a facility that's over the hills towards the, uh, the uh, Silic uh, San Joaquin Valley where we use high explosives to compress materials rather than lasers and study that research. Uh, it is a nuclear weapons lab. So our main mission and what we benefit from in the ICF program is the, f the fact that uh, it was one of the key design labs for the nuclear weapon stockpile, and so we have a mission to maintain that stockpile. And so we get a lot of resources that fall out from that. Uh, we also worry about threat reduction, um, you know, deterrence uh, of our adversaries, and then we fall, you know, an ICF program falls largely into this energy and climate security, right? We're trying to make sure that an adversary can't disrupt our, our energy needs in our country. We rely heavily on these three key STEM areas. I mean, uh, it's, it's, it, we, 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 could, we can't hire enough people to su stock that, that supply. And in particular, computing, as you might imagine, is a challenge because we are you know, 20 miles from Silicon Valley. So it, it actually both computing and engineering. Um, we have a number of facilities in the laser world um, that I, I work on besides NIF. There's, there's JLF. Well, I shouldn't say just the laser world. I, I saw that. But we also have what I, I talked to you about, uh, radiochemistry. So being able to ascertain what went on in some process that occurred by, you know, so we talk about uh, th threats, radiative act um, um, uh, radiological threats to our security. We got to go back and figure out where did that come from? What were they, what processes were they were using? So we have a forensic science center that, that worries about that. Computing is a huge enterprise. We have some of the uh, most powerful supercomputers uh, in the world and we use these resources for a variety of different missions. 
Uh, we have the CAM center and the high explosives facility as well, if that is of interest. And just to put it in perspective, Livermore is one of 17 national labs across the U.S. Uh, spanning science and technology, mission space. Any one of these labs has programs uh, maybe very focused, but are similar to what I just described for students and postdocs. So if science and engineering is of interest to you and you want to do it in the interest of uh, our nation, these are the places to go. And they, they all have kind of unique um, capacities and unique requirements, but they're also fairly uniquely resourced to do those missions. So they're great places to work and consider for your, uh, your future. And with that, I think I'll close. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's really wonderful to be a part of all of the people that are welcoming you to U of A Optics. Uh, I work in Professor Russell Chipman's um, lab in polarization imaging. I came to optics through an initial passion for photography, and one thing that has not changed is how much I love looking at image data, um, especially, of course, when it involves discovery and I don't understand it the first time I see it. So I've tried to populate this talk with lots of images, and hopefully I'm going to be able to explain them enough that you appreciate uh, why they are of interest to me and of interest in so many technologies. And so this uh, is a polarimetric picture of the, the Meinel building that we're currently in. And as you know, the offices have these beautiful 10-foot uh, windows looking out onto the mountains. And the building had a problem several years ago where these were spontaneously fracturing and some of them even spontaneously shattering. And this was happening over and over again in different offices. And I don't know how much you know about polarization, but one thing that might come to mind is that it can be used to evaluate stress by refringence. And so we had the idea that we could go out and take a picture of the building, image the stress by refringence, and probably predict which window was going to be the next one to break. I never did the experiment because I didn't want any suspicion coming my way. So the instrument that I'm going to show you and the images that I'm going to show you are all motivated um, by atmospheric science applications. And Ray Caustic yesterday had a question of how can optics be used for climate change um, applications. And polarimetric imaging um, is certainly an example of one of those. And so these are some images of high altitude um, polarization imagery. This is really just the beginning. Um, I've heard several different launch dates, um, but soon we will be taking polarimetric images from satellites. Um, so really the data that we're analyzing here at U of A and some of the prototype um, high altitude data that's being taken is just the beginning. We're about for the first time to be seeing the Earth's uh, very diverse polarimetric picture. So a little definition of what is polarization, and I'm sure all of you are already familiar with the canonical plane wave, and you're probably writing down complex exponentials um, in some of your classes, and so I'm sure you're familiar with what is the wavelength and what a monochromatic plane wave looks like. What do you write down in front of that complex exponential? Maybe you write down one number, and in that case you're doing scalar wave theory, right? Or perhaps you write down two numbers, and in which case you're doing vector-based wave theory, right? And so here in the picture of the wave, is my laser pointer going to show up? Um, the transverse plane is perpendicular to the direction of propagation, right? And so if you're just writing down one number, then presumably in that orthogonal direction in the transverse plane, presumably the, there's no field and it's zero, and your scalar wave is linearly polarized. If you write down an EX and an EY component, then you have the general solution, and the projection of this onto the transverse plane is going to be an ellipse for the most general solution. I teach Russell's polarization class in the spring uh, for the second time, actually, this semester. And one of the things I do, based on some friendships that I have in the College of Education, is I do a pre-knowledge quiz. And it's not graded, and it benefits me more than them because one of the things you need to do as an instructor is kind of understand what people's uh, 
assumptions and maybe even misconceptions are on a given topic, right? And I will tell you the question that nearly everyone fails, and I brought it back to Russell, and he said, I don't know that many faculty members would get it right. And that is monochromatic light is always, sometimes, or never polarized. Because you can think of polarization in a lot of different ways, right? You can think of light as polarized in the absence of any source of incoherence, right? You need incoherence to depolarize. Or you can think of light as unpolarized, and then it needs some light-matter interaction to become polarized. So the answer to the quiz is that monochromatic light is always polarized, even for speckle patterns. But at different points in that speckle pattern, you'll just get different ellipses in the transverse plane. But unpolarized light is what we experience when we go outside and the sun is all around us, right? Because there's plenty of sources of incoherence, spectral coherence, spatial coherence, temporal coherence. And so in direct sol solar illumination, um, to a very good approximation, we have unpolarized light hitting the Earth. There's a few other sources of illumination, which you know, because if you just look at a shadow outside, the umbra and the penumbra of that shadow are not pitch black, right? And so in there you have the illumination uh, from the diffuse atmospheric scattering from the sky dome. And I'll show you some examples in the talk where I have evidence through measuring uh, polar metric measurements that you also have just a little bit of radiation that bounces off nearby objects, right, onto one another. Okay, so we have this um, unpolarized incidence, and then when reflected from the Earth, becomes slightly polarized, right? So we no longer have that scramble in the transverse plane that we did with something that's unpolarized. Well, it still looks pretty scrambled. It's only partially polarized. But we would start to see some preferential orientation um, for the oscillation of the field. And so here I have a cartoon of what would be the top of atmosphere or even satellite-based measurements. And, and there we have kind of a signal plus background problem, right? Very classic engineering problem, where the signal that we're interested in is the radiation um, that's scattered by the atmosphere. And I mentioned that in the beginning, that we have an atmospheric science application, right? But what do they want to know exactly? Uh, it's the scattering phase function of the particles, right, that we're measuring. And we've been measuring, of course, you know, satellites have been hyperspectral for decades and decades now. And that type of spectral information is very good uh, for diagnosing our science, like the color of oceans, right, is, uh, is very important, for example. And similarly, the scattering phase function for the atmosphere um, is what helps to speciate what exactly is in the atmosphere, uh, make measurements of particulate matter size. This is very important for epidemiology because it's especially those very small aerosols that penetrate deep inside your body. And so the motivation uh, for the research I'm going to show you and for going around campus and taking all of these polarization pictures was to both develop and validate uh, models for the polarimetric scattering from the Earth's surface so that we can make a contribution to this signal plus background problem. Aerosol retrievals over the ocean are much easier than aerosol retrievals in urban environments. But of course, that's where they're very vital. So let's start by talking about one of the greatest polarimetric phenomena in nature, and that is the beautiful rainbow. Right? And the rainbow is polarized because, as you've probably learned or read, this is a total internal reflection off of a water droplet that's causing the other uh, rainbow and the dispersion that we see. And that total internal reflection is at approximately Brewster's angle. So rainbows are highly polarized. When you walk around with your polarized sunglasses, you maybe have even seen rainbows that then friends that don't have polarized sunglasses on cannot see. I've certainly had that experience. And so the polarization of the rainbow follows tangentially to the arc. And so if you were to remove your glasses and move them around, you could actually find an orientation that would enhance the contrast of the rainbow. And in the orthogonal direction, you could find an orientation that would extinguish at least most of the rainbow, right? Because the orientation follows tangentially with the bow. And so sort of using that example, I want to tell you how you would measure Stokes parameters, because it's really, really easy, 
you would simply make a measurement in two different orthogonal directions and take the difference between those measurements to come up with what we call Q and U, our Stokes parameters. So in this notation, I is just the total radiance, right? This is what we see without any polarimetry. And you could get that by adding two of the measurements. And it would be the difference in those two orthogonal measurements that would give you your Stokes parameters. So the instrument I'm going to talk about is the Multispectral Polarimetric Imager, or MISV. And this is, uh, this, you know, in one little snapshot here, this represents um, decades and decades of work of many, many people, um, both at NASA and here at U of A. And on the left, this is the very first lab prototype of the instrument. This is the ground-based instrument um, that was here at U of A for about eight years. Um, including when I first joined as a research scientist. This was the first project that I worked on. This is an ER-2. This is a high-altitude um, NASA aircraft. And here is a little MISV mounted here to take downward-looking measurements. We'll look at some of those image data. And I've heard several different launch dates. I've heard uh, 2021. I've heard 2022. Um, but it absolutely has been approved that, as I was telling you, we'll soon be seeing um, the Earth's polarimetry uh, from space. So this is very exciting, creates a lot of opportunities um, for people that know how to use this data. MISB is, uh, this is not actually the specs for the satellite instrument, but for the ground-based instrument. Um, there's 10 spectral bands, three of which um, polarimetry is measured, given by the asterisk. Um, and the degree of linear polarization accuracy is a half a percent. So when this spec was achieved 10 years ago, it was uh, absolutely one of a kind. And as Russell and I started looking at ground MISB data, he said, please appreciate that no one has this data set right now except for us. In five years, a lot of people will, right? But for right now, this is a very unique data set. And I will tell you that Sony now has a wire grid um, polarizer available commercially uh, for only about $2,000. So today, you can now actually take many of the images that I'm going to show you. Maybe not at the same spatial resolution, um, but the point is that the technology is developing very, very fast. And if we pause just on a moment for that half a percent accuracy, if you were to do the measurement with the sunglasses the way I told you and just take differences, in addition to all the edge artifacts and problems with that, I would be quite surprised if you could achieve 10 or even 15 percent accuracy, right, with that kind of... Um, crude method. Because the polarized light from the land surface is not very highly polarized, right? So we need this level of accuracy. So this is what ground MISP looks like. Um, it's a push broom scanner. There's um, two photoelastic modulators that are um, heterodyned to slow down the signal such that it's read out by a CCD. And uh, right now, you might wonder what it's taking a picture of, right? This is the front of the camera, and it's doing sky scans. And because we're polarization blind, we look up in the sky, and we see homogeneous blue, right? And you guys have learned a lot about Rayleigh scattering, right, and, and dipole oscillations in the sky, but maybe not as much about the partial polarization of the sky. So that's what I'd like to start by showing you some pictures of. So now we get to look at data, my favorite part. Um, so this is at 660. And on the left, this is the total radiance. So this is what you would get from nonpolar metric imaging. And here are the two Stokes parameters, linear Stokes parameters that I told you about. And because we are polarization blind, it can sometimes be tricky to know exactly how to visualize polarization data, right? Because it doesn't inherently make a lot of sense to us. Um, I kind of like this color scale, especially since these are differential quantities. So Q is zero if you had the same amount of horizontal and vertical polarization. And then the, the color bar sort of shows you uh, which orientation is preferred for these measurements. And so a few immediate observations. It's not homogeneous. The sky is not homogeneous. And clouds are very depolarizing, right? So the clouds are, are typically um, have an even smaller polarization signature. But still kind of difficult, I would say, to interpret in this, uh, 
in this sort of rendering. And so what we do is we look at the degree of linear polarization, right? And now we can make a few more observations, the degree of linear polarization being a, a, a little bit higher here towards the horizon and lower up here. I think I'm going to put the sun position. Yeah, it's important to know that the sun is about right here. And by looking at the arc tan of the ratio of those Stokes parameters, then we can associate what is the angle of this linear polarization, right? And so how to visualize that? Well, I can show it to you in a really weirdo color scale, right? Or I can try to put the color scale here on the wheel, use arrows, and then overlay the arrows. So then maybe you can begin to be convinced that this angle of linear polarization is following tangentially around the sun. And so clear sky polarization um, is well known, well studied, um, and of interest um, to this day. You'll see very recent publications on how to measure this. Um, insects are not polarization blind, right? So the rhodopsin in the retina of an insect actually has a preferential orientation. Um, and so for this reason, when, when insects look up in the sky, if they really look up, I don't know, they don't really have necks, but um, the, the sky dome is a very important compass to them, right? So this is how they're orienting. This is how they know time of day, how to get back to the beehive. Uh, and there's lots of studies about how the bee actually does not go so far to pollinate on overcast skies, right? And you can postulate this is because they're using the sky's polarization for orientation. And so here's little um, tick marks or little sprinkles uh, meant to give you some information about the partial polarization. This marks the sun. And so the orientation of the tick mark shows you the tangential relationship that we already talked about. And then the length of this tick mark is to donate the amount of partial polarization. And so the closer you are to the sun, right, then the smaller the scattering angle. And at small scattering angles, the polarization signature is lower. This is kind of like a general principle, right, when you look at Fresnel reflections. And this is the reason that high numerical aperture systems have to think about polarization aberrations, right? So people in polarization, we live at those large scattering angles, right? And sure enough, at larger scattering angles is where you'll see. So uh, when the sun is setting, right, you would have a maximum polarization of the sky overhead, for example. And there's a really cool phenomenon called Brewster's patch, if you ever want to look it up where then the, the polarization of the sky is approximately vertical. So if you are looking at uh, like a puddle or a water surface, it looks dark. So that's Brewster's patch. Want to look up later. And so here's another way that we can look at sky polarization. And if you got used to looking at these kind of color scales, you would say, oh, red is minimum. So I can know, for instance, that the sun is in the southeast portion of the sky. All right, before we look at image data, let me just say one little word about what is scattering plane, right? So the scattering plane is defined by the line of sight of the camera and the position of the sun, right? One point, one vector define this plane. And so the scattering plane is changing as we do imaging throughout the day and the sun changes position in the sky. I worked with atmospheric scientists long enough to stop saying that the sun moves. So here's what our data looks like. Um, and the rotation of the wheel represents um, that scattering plane change that I talked about. So what do we notice? Uh, one thing to notice, if this is large enough to read, is that the blue sky is remaining cyan. This is 90 degrees from the scattering plane. This is the predicted polarization based on Rayleigh scattering. Right? Another observation, most of this stuff is cyan. So this is based on single scattering events, right? So we know that most of this partial polarization we can predict with rough surface scattering models and Fresnel equations. Not everything, but many things. Look at the grass. The road is nearly cyan. Um, this is a brick building across the street. This, uh, this is actually the bus stop in front of the building, these curved metal awnings. And you can see that the, the brick here remains mostly cyan. And so this is what motivates rough surface um, scattering models, which are, are pretty ubiquitous in polarization um, 
And what we mean by rough, of course, is like optically rough. It's a function of the wavelength, right? So you can also see the trend that towards the shorter wavelength, more things are cyan as compared to over here. And we have a lot of projects now on um, long wave and IR polarimetry is becoming very popular. So of course you adjust the models. You can also render the data differently, of course, which you always need to do in data analysis, right? Look at it one way, it makes no sense. Look at it a different way, it becomes very obvious. Uh, and so when you look in meridional planes and you don't um, change the orientation with the sky, then you can notice things like some of the man-made materials that have a polarization orientation invariant to the illumination geometry. This is also on campus. This is in front of the Arizona State Museum. This is a bronze sculpture. And if you look at the head of the sculpture, um, you can see one thing. You can see the cyan, which is just the spectral reflection of the sun off of that metal, right? But concentrate your attention on the lower half um, of that sphere. And this is illuminated instead by the sky dome. And when illuminated by the sky dome, we can see the angle of linear polarization following tangentially with that surface. And again, you see a lot of cyan in the picture overall, right, from the bricks and cactus, gravel, things like that. And again, this AOLP is constant throughout the day for this man-made object. Oh, and you might think, well, sure, it's a metal, you know, polarization in metals. You know, big deal. Uh, this also is true for smooth objects, right? This tangential AOLP. And so, you know, we postulate this largely is a function um, of the surface texture, right? Not just of the, the complex valued index of those materials. Okay, so polarization light scattering sort of depends on everything, which makes it very powerful but it can certainly make the models very difficult uh, to come up with and even more so to invert. So polarization imaging has a lot of surface albedo effects, right? One of my favorite sort of seminal texts in the area is um, Gunther Konin. Um, this is a, a Dutch scientist and he has a lot of very nice writings freely available on his website. And so 40 years ago, he drew this picture, right? Which he probably came about by looking at cars through sheet polarizers and said, yes, you can expect the plane of polarization to follow tangentially with these surfaces. And we absolutely found that to be correct uh, when we went out and did the experiment, um, depending on the surface albedo. So the white car follows this prediction and the black car has a, a plane of um, polarization that is flipped 90 degrees. So we postulate that this is because one dominant polarization exudance is from the first surface reflection and the other is from a refraction. So when you have something that's very low albedo, like the black car, uh, there's not going to be an appreciable penetration into the material that's then refracted back out. When you have the high albedo of the white car, you're going to be seeing radiant exudants from more multiple interaction type of events because of that higher albedo. And so we postulate that it's refraction from that surface for the white car that's flipping that polarization. Now in general, a, a polarized light scattering dependence on Albedo is nothing new, uh, so Umov's effect uh, is very well known, and this tells us that black objects are going to have a higher degree of polarized light scattering as compared to white objects. And that geometric uh, argument is very similar to what I just told you. So here in intensity, you see a contrast reversal when we look at the degree of polarization. But it really bothered me about that black and white car and I wanted to sort of check that conjecture. And so I went out and found a car that had a different albedo at different wavelengths, right? And sure enough, we were able to see um, that AOLP flip um, in a red colored vehicle, right? So it looks more like the white car in one wavelength and more like the black car in another. Polarization depends on illumination. So here's the Stewart Observatory, um, just across from this building, just simply on two different days. 
And again, you're seeing an angle of linear polarization that's flipped 90 degrees. So on the right-hand side, this is a clear sky day. Um, and it's behaving, the polarized light scattering is behaving more like the white vehicle that I showed you. And here on the completely overcast day, it's illuminated by the sky dome, right? Not by that direct solar illumination. And so instead, you have um, specular reflections off of the sky dome, causing the AOLP to be approximately 90 degrees flipped from the clear sky day. Another page uh, from Gunther's book, and he says, well, when you're in the shadow, when, you're, um, when your source of illumination is the diffuse sky dome, you can expect uh, tangential polarization to the surface. And so this is a really nice example of that because here on the podium, we have the two orthogonal surfaces. And if you refer to the color legend, you can see on the ground, the cyan, um, 90 degrees um, AOLP, right up against the red. And the same thing in the foreground here, right? So some of the projects that we're doing today are related to computer vision and scene recognition and use of polarization. And so in that application, people get very excited um, by things, by image data like this. And now here's what I got really excited about when I saw this data. Look at this little yellow region right here that has this intermediate polarization. And something I've always loved about imaging, right? If you had sort of a point detector and you would go, is it noise? I don't know, let me measure it again. Is it noise? Let me measure it again. Let me measure it again, right? But with imaging, you have spatial correlations. And so when you have, you know, spatial correlations like this and in the foreground, you have these repeated measurements to help you differentiate when your measurements are not simply noise effects, right? So I became pretty convinced um, that this is a, a sort of multiple... Um, interaction, um, adjacency, reflected field onto the ground. And the reason that's exciting is because we would expect circular polarization in these areas. I'm only measuring linear polarization, but in some of the computer vision interactions, they might really want to know shape cues like this, and we can get those through circular polarization. So I want to end by, because of course we're all very much hoping that we get to see you again and work with you. Um, I love working on hard problems. I love working with students that love working on hard problems. Um, and Lisa Lee is uh, the graduate student in charge of our computer vision um, polarization project. We created an adversarial example where all these objects are white, but some are wood, some are fabric. And we showed that when you compare um, unpolarized imaging to polarized imaging, you can differentiate those objects better. Um, I mentioned the long wave IR um, polarimetry. Kira Hart is the graduate student in charge of this. She did all of the optical design herself in her first year as a first year graduate student. So that's absolutely a big deal. Hi, Kira. <laughs> I actually didn't know you were here when I started to say that. <laughs> Uh, so this uh, prototype has been fabricated uh, here at the U of A Optics Lab um, and delivered to our sponsor at Goddard. This is designed to go into a CubeSat, and the uh, polarimeter is very small. It's just one U um, denoted here in the picture. This is a channeled spectropolarimeter, so we use a diffraction grating to reconstruct um, that polarization signature. Uh, we're also working in machine learning, so my research is at the intersection of imaging science and optical engineering. And so with machine learning, uh, many commercial applications, they have so much training data, they need multiple server farms, right? But in scientific prototype imaging, we usually are very limited in the amount of training data we have. So we're assessing convolutional neural networks for limited training data. We're looking at compression methods um, that can sort of improve that performance. And we've also discovered very uh, simple full rank operators that can be used to basically fool the convolutional neural networks. That concludes my talk. Thank you for your attention.